All right, the next thing we're going to talk about are the postulates of quantum mechanics. After we talk about the postulates of quantum mechanics, we're actually going to apply quantum mechanics to systems. So we won't, like, we'll still have a lot of math and junk, but at least it will be semi real systems or things we can be interested in. Have you ever talked about postulates in any of your other classes? Okay. What is a postulate? It's like a rule. It's a statement uh, that is assumed but not proven. In some cases, you can't really prove them or we haven't found a way to prove them. So statements, or at least a postulate, a singular one, is a statement that is assumed Not proven. I'm sure a mathematician or doctor, if you knew who Dr. Hansen was, would be mad at me describing it that way, but that's how we're going to roll. Okay. These are like the tenets that define quantum mechanics. You might be saying, well, why do we even care if they're not proven? Like, we only care about proving. There have been literally, probably at this point, billions or hundreds of millions of measurements of quantum chemical systems that work. It might not be the best model, but it's the model that functions and it predicts a lot of weird things. So, for example, when we were talking about the double slit and keeping looking at detectors and position and stuff, that's predicted by quantum mechanics. Another fun one, I don't know if you've ever seen it, so let's, is spooky action. So, weird things predicted. By QM. That agree with experiment. One of my favorite ones is something called spooky action. No one knows what spooky action is, right? Okay. What you can do is is you can entangle two particles. They've done this with some relatively big stuff now. And it's kind of how teleportation can also work too, which is really weird. If you take a quantum particle and one, they're entangled, one has to be spin down. And one has to be spin up and they communicate to one another. Quantum mechanics predicts that it doesn't matter the distance between these two things. If you change this one to an up, what has to happen to the other one? Changes to a down. It doesn't matter the distance. Distance doesn't show up at all. So what they have done is, is they have uh, teleported or pushed particles really far across the world and as soon as they modify this one, boom, this one goes instantaneously. They move this one over here, boom, that one goes back. Distance doesn't matter. That is really, really, really weird. But they can control it, and it's instantaneous. It's crazy. So it doesn't matter. Like, I think they have done um, systems where they've had stuff in, like, Washington or on the East Coast, and then they push a particle all the way to Hawaii, and they can flip them, and they, it happens instantaneously, which is really weird. 
strange. Okay, so the other aspect is, is, is it predicts a lot of weird things, even like electronic spin, which wasn't measured till later on. Like we know electrons have an intrinsic spin value to them, and that was determined through quantum mechanics. So let's talk about each of these postulates. A lot of these postulates we've already discussed, but we haven't formally said that it's a postulate of quantum mechanics. So postulate one. The state of a quantum system. quantum mechanical system, and remember I'm just going to shorten the quantum mechanical to QM, is specified by by what? For what do we always need or have we always looked at for a quantum system? So if I want to get the energy out, I got to use, you have to know the wave function. So we just say everything about a quantum system is dictated by the wave function. I'm going to shorten postulate just to P, P2. Probability finding a quantum chemical particle is given by What would you do or what mathematics do you have to do to figure out the probability of a quantum particle? Mm -hmm. Yep. So we've done that a handful of times already. Postulate three has to deal with observables for every measured property there exists quantum mechanical And then we're going to leave a word off. If we measure an observable or some sort of property, how could we calculate that? So there has to be a what to calculate that. Or let's look back at the, the Hamiltonian equation. What was the Hamiltonian equation again? No, oh, not no, you don't need the whole thing, just in the simplest form. Oh, yeah. You could even go even simpler than that. H what? Yeah. Time, well, operating on what? Yep, and what's that spit out for you? Yep. Okay. This is our observable, right? What do we need to calculate that observable? Yeah, we need an operator. So for every measured property, there exists a quantum mechanical operator. Okay. 
postulate four is a little bit more mathematical, but it still relates to operators. In any single measurement, Seems weird that I'm saying it, but we'll explain why I need to say it this way when we talk about something called expectation values. Of an observable that corresponds to some operator A hat. The only measured values are eigenvalues of a hat. So if you have operator A and you operate on a wave function, sometimes you can get multiple constants. Which seems weird. It's just sometimes you see weird math. And the only measured values you can get are eigenvalues of A. Does that make sense? Or at least can you understand that statement? It might not make sense right now. So that corresponds to a single measurement, but what if we look at an average? The average of a large number of measurements So it really depends on the type of spectroscopy you use when we're talking about a large number of measurements. So like we put something in a UV vis, we get, I don't know, got wavelength along here. We get something that looks like that, right? When we put it into a UV vis. This is a large number of measurements because we have a large number of quantum particles. The reason that this is so broad is, is you have a bunch of quantum systems. If we could look at a single molecule or a single atom, so this is large number. If we looked at a single atom or a single molecule, would we have these big broad spectrums? or bands, what would it look like if it were single atoms or molecules? Would they be broad? Yeah, they could be a little tiny, but let's say we bump the gain up or we, like, we have a really good instrument that can measure that signal. Will it still be wide? Yeah. It would be individual lines. Exactly, because there you're in a more quantized system. So when we talk about P4 or postulate number four, we're really talking about a small or a single particle. Here, we're talking about a large number of particles or a large number of measurements. So you have to keep like the type of spectroscopy you're doing in mind. Most of the time, we're doing this. But if you go to like some places for graduate school or you're doing atomic absorption spectroscopy or other portions, you might be in this region. Like they can do a single molecule fluorescence which seems crazy, but you can actually get a signal. You can trap a single molecule in a laser beam, which is nuts to even think about. You can hit it with radiation and you can measure something off of it. Crazy.
All right. Anyways, but in our world, this is what we're trying to measure. So a large number of measurements that corresponds to our good old friend a hat. So we have that operator a hat is the expectation value. Okay. So we're going to measure some, we want to get the expectation value of some parameter alpha. The way that that's calculated is you conduct this operation. Okay. You might be thinking, why can't I just pull out this integral and do whatever? Remember, operators always act to the right. It can change things. Something might not necessarily be Hermitian without looking. We'll hit expectation values again in a spot that makes more sense when we talk about particle in a box, though. The last postulate, which is kind of boring, kind of given at this point, the evolution of time. So if you look at a system and you watch it over time, if you're, you're trying to model it, you just need the time-dependent Schrodinger equation to figure out what happens to it. The evolution in time of a quantum mechanical system is governed by Time dependent Schrodinger equation. Most of the time, we're going to assume that we don't have to worry about time, but it does make a big deal in some cases. Those are all the things I want you to accept. If you take graduate level work or you go into physics, they dive into these really deeply. I don't think it's worth our time to do that. Are there any questions about these? You, like, you don't have to memorize these. What I care about is, is you know like what a, not even quite yet, but what an expectation value is, when would you use it, when would you need to do, look at a single measurement, and just understand the words on the board. Okay? No questions about that one, right?